Wet your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody can. Wet your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's gonna happen. <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you, no, nah, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> University of Texas for a reason because you want to be the best you want to play the best you can't discard what they done done over the last uh, decade you know all the national championships they won so we got a, a heck of a test coming Saturday but like I said we're gonna prepare and we're gonna be ready for it clarified this offseason that the horns down hand gesture would be a penalty what have you addressed that with the team going into this game what, what, what's that the horns down hand gesture could be a 15 yard penalty I have not addressed it with the team, but I appreciate you letting me know that. So, you know, we got a lot of other things we need to really worry about. <laughs> JB, J. Bullware, a highly regarded, highly respected college pro coach. He's done it all. Good friends. And he is a VIP alumni on Stories Inside the Man Cave. My friend, welcome. The day before this big game here in Austin, Texas. Wow. How about it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already saw my first Alabama guy, too, man. It was like, what are you, what are you doing at Bird Bird Biscuit? <laughs> you know what I mean? How do you know about that place? <laughs> so, yeah, that was kind of neat. It's a. Uh, I saw so much Alabama Crimson while I was working today is actually downtown. I mean, they had, it's like when you step onto a fire ant mound, they're out everywhere already yes. wearing that Crimson. Yes. Yes. And as you know, in the sec, they get in town on Thursday night, you know, <laughs> Thursday night they're here and, and they're not leaving until Sunday. So. That's, I love it. I love yes. it, and that's what yes. – this is about to be an SEC town. And Oh, I, I got to tell you, uh, so there's a young lady and her husband who – she's on TikTok, and she creates these – she is a sports nut, and she and her husband travel around the country. I reached out to her on TikTok, and I missed her at the tailgate last week, she and her husband. First ever Longhorn football game, and she is a Clemson girl. And she goes, you guys are – Definitely SEC. You guys belong. It's going to be fun. Come see us at a Gamecock game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they missed out on the opportunity to give that the best name. <laughs> I'm not oh going to God. say it on air. <laughs> they had some choices. <laughs> if you're still, if you're talking about South Carolina, you the, the Cox cocky man. What is that? What is that? <laughs> oh my God! So it says episode 175 uh, with Jay Bullware. Um, former Longhorn, product of this, the great city of Irving, um, played with some guys. He was there for uh, the f last Southwest Conference championship and the first Big 12 championship. And today, it, it's yeah, we're going to talk a little Texas, Alabama, but we really want to give him a, a, a boost, so to speak, and promote something that Jay has started to do that I thought was a great idea. He told me about it. It didn't shock me. I was just shocked of when I heard it and he's launching his own podcast and I want to pull up a graphic. This is your graphic. I added a little to it. I hope you don't mind. I don't uh, mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. it. A little juice with coach Jay Bullware. I mean, what, what went behind this idea? Because I think a lot of people, once they find out about this, everybody wants to know what a coach sees decisions and all the travels and, and plays and games and all of your experiences and your critique from a coach's eye? Well, you know, it, it kind of happened two ways and maybe three. Uh, <laughs> talking to, you know, ex-players, you know, they all call me, ask me about, you know, ball at some point in time. And I start talking and I talk differently, yeah. you know, and, 
and one of the guys I I'll, I'll I won't forget um, uh, last week or week and a half ago, I think it was Todd Hunt said yeah. something to me. He's like, man, you should start a podcast. And before he said that, I had at least two or three other people tell me this, the exact same thing. So I just sat back and said, you know what? I'm going to do this. It sounds like it sounds like fun. I'm going to I'm going to, you know, spend the next week and a half or so, whatever it was to get this thing ironed out. And I don't know anything about this stuff. You know, I'm not this is not my wheelhouse at all. You know what I mean? If it's not a talking about possession down football or special teams or offensive line, running backs, whatever, uh, it is not in my wheelhouse. So that that in itself was a challenge, you know, to do all this stuff and figure out artwork and yeah. editing and you know, all this stuff. So it, it's, it's, it's not great, <laughs> but you know what? I put my heart into it and yeah, I did. That's all I that did, matters. Yeah, I did what I could. And it turned out, I was pleased with the, with the results. Now, I mean, I'm going to dress it up as I continue to go along and, you know, change up some things just like you did with this artwork. Um, but, but that was the big thing of getting this thing started. And the last phase of that was, you know, figuring out, exactly how I was going to do it. And it didn't take me long at all because I was privileged for, uh, what was it? Uh, 18 games, 17 in the regular season, uh, plus one or however many it was in the NFL last year. Cause we played like four, um, preseason games too. I actually got to sit down and see Mike Tomlin present that information to the football team every single week. Oh my goodness. Man. And it blew me away. I, you know, I've always done scouting reports, you know, each week, like sometimes coaches will choose one coach to do it, or it's just the head coach that does it, whatever, however it's done. Uh, so I've been, I've been, been a part of that before, but to sit there and listen to him do it. Um, and the way he went about presenting information. Now I don't have all the video and stuff that, he, you know, that I normally have. So I'm just watching games, but I can still see some of the same things that we as coaches look for. And, um, it, it was, it wasn't, it was it was a no brainer. I said, I'm doing it this way yeah. and I'm taking Mike Tomlin's, um, shell for how he presented his information to, to present it in this podcast. So the one thing that I, people who follow football, all levels, there's a reason Mike Tomlin has had so much job stability. He's articulate. Yes. He's smart. He goes beyond football and he, and obviously he's one, but what you've got to learn from him. What did you learn about him, Mike Tomlin, that maybe you had no clue about the guy before, just from the outside? Man, that's a really good question because it's multi-layered, right? But I'm going to give you just two, right? The first thing is he's a great leader of men. Not a good one, but a great leader of men. And I saw that day in and day out in that building. The second one is he told me something that I'll never forget, and I'm going to incorporate it in my coaching style, uh, you know, from that point going forward. He said, and I saw, it's funny too, Sean, because I saw this one day, and I didn't know what it was that I was looking at. So I pull up in the driveway in the parking lot uh, before I go into work, and I used to get in about 5, 5.15 every, every morning, and Mike would come in shortly thereafter. I wanted to beat him in every day, right? Um, so... I'm in there and I'm sitting in my car and I happen to see Mike already there. And I'm like, oh, dang. But he sat in his car for like 20 minutes because I, I sat there and I watched him. I'm like, man, his car is there. You know, I think he's in there. So I got out so I wouldn't look like I'm staring. And then he later told us uh, in a meeting, I believe it was a team meeting, that he got this from Tony Dungy. He said he'll sit in the car for about 20 minutes or however long it is, and think of how can I make everybody's day better in that building? Wow. What can I do to be of service to the people in that building that day? You know, as I look at myself and what I want to be as a coach and what, you know, that's like, that's me. That's why God put me here for this year. I needed to hear that because that's the type of person I want to be. I obviously look up to Dungy and I obviously look up to Mike as well. So, man, that that was it for me. That That was everything. He's just – listen, I've only interviewed the guy when the uh, Super Bowl was in Arlington, the ice storm week. Yes. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to trying to go back and forth, moving at a slow pace. But 
he's just so down to earth, down to earth guy. And you can tell that there's more to him outside of football. A lot yes. more, a lot yes. more. He's composed, if you will. Experience, yes. family. Yes, all that. He's a great dude. He's a real dude. You know, it, it's it kind of surprised me his coaching style on the field. You know, because he 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 will say that, hey, I just go around badgering people all day. <laughs> he just goes around talking noise to everybody. I mean, the same. You know, I I do that, and sometimes it's received okay, and some some guys are like, you know, oh man, he's on me or whatever. But Coach Tomlin does it day in and day out, and that's what he does. He goes around and talks noise to the DBs when it's DBs versus wide receivers, or he talk noise to the wide receiver, you know, whoever needed to step up that day in practice because of who we were playing. It was very well thought out. It wasn't just, you know, a rant. It was like, okay, we're playing a four-down team this week. Tight ends versus DNs is big, you know. You don't see very many four-down teams. So your tight end battle versus the defensive ends is a huge battle in the run game. So he'll go down there and talk noise to the tight ends, <laughs> you know, and he just constantly did that through practice and kept the practice energetic and lighthearted. And it, it was just a fun atmosphere. It was a great guy to work for. What a great experience. So, Jay, I mentioned um, in the Irving area, uh, one of the, you know, when John Makovic was coach, he, you were part of one of his initial really quality offensive recruiting classes because the guy knew offense regardless of the criticism of him as a coach because uh you know that at that time the texas program needed to there needed to be a, a, a some infusion of energy um you had a you had john mackovic well david mcwilliams recruited you first yes sir yes sir david then McWilliams. McWilliams. and then you know of course You've got to be experienced. Uh, it's just amazing. Your 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 resume is this long <laughs> of where you've been, but I'm going to highlight a couple of places. OU with Bob Stoops and Lincoln Riley, both of them, correct? Yes. Um, Auburn, Gene Chiswick, and a national championship ring. Some, uh, I think, some great FCS schools as well. Um, this podcast. How do you how how are you going to just tie that all together? with the games that you can critique what what's the what's the plan here that you think would be of how can i say this of interest because it's to me when you present the idea i loved it immediately right well here's the thing right when most people look at a video in a game or whatever on tv they see you know the game a play you know well i kind of see it all you know uh, I see a bull rush by Will Anderson to a rip move, almost get home. You know, I see a coverage that they're playing or or, um, you know, they're not tackling or not run support with their with their with their nickel and dime. They're run support with their safety. I see different things, yeah. you know, than the average person that watches video. Hey, every time they throw deep, they're throwing a number three. You, you know what I mean? I mean, I see things like that. You know, now, does it carry over? you know, on tape, you know, across a six to seven game breakdown, or usually most teams go five or six games, whatever it is. Um, I can't tell you that, right? I don't have that video available to me, but I do have the same video that everybody else has right now, which is I'm watching this game. I'm watching how he's calling the plays. I'm watching who he's trying to get the ball in certain situations. When possession ball comes, you know, who's making the play? Who are they going to? When they get down in the red zone, who are they trying to throw to? So it's more than just, hey, this guy scored a touchdown or they threw to this guy. It's when are they throwing to him? How are they trying to get him the ball? You know, you know, what's going to happen with the quarterback sitting up there directing the protection? And, and does he know where the free hitter is coming from? You can tell that stuff on tape, yes. you know, and, and the average person doesn't look at it like that. They see a, they see a quarterback drop back and throw the ball and he either delivers it or he doesn't. Well, I see a quarterback that sees a rush, drops back, rolls out of the pocket on the right, they lose contain, and now he's scrambling, and he has 100 yards rushing in the game. You know, so that's how I look at it, you know, and, and that comes from, you know, uh, just years and years of watching football. You know, that, that, that accumulates over, the, over time, and you kind of see things from a big-picture standpoint. And that's from a lot of film work, too. Yes. Dissecting, diagnosing plays and cause and effect, all of that. Now, this is it's going to be interesting because I and then we're going to I want to help him. He won't need my help, but uh, we're going to promote uh, 
JB's uh, podcast, a little juice with Coach Jay Bulware on our social platforms. And I, I that's you know, I can't wait to do that. But something that as a coach, you you have love for your alma mater, your your longhorn for life, but like me, but on a much different level, you see the game a little differently. You're, you're excited, but it's not on a the level of the general fan. But the hype in ATX with Alabama here is is legit. How would you describe it? That what you've seen, the energy oh, for this gosh. game. Hey, it's going to be incredible atmosphere. I mean, yeah. that's where I turn into a fan. Yeah. You know, the atmosphere, even even as a coach, you know, when you're you know, packing up on a Friday like these guys are doing and going to the hotel somewhere, um, wherever that is. It used to be uh, the Doubletree when I played, and then right. we, we end up switching to the Marriott when I came back. And anyway, so when you pack up and go, you can see and feel the energy around the, the campus. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so as a player, coach, whatever, you feel that. Fan, we all feel that. We all feel this atmosphere and what's about to go down tomorrow. Now, what they have to do is take that out, you know, feed off of it, if you must, when they get in the stadium. But they got to focus on the game, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really the, you know, you can't be thinking about my mom, my dad, you know, my brother, my sister all here. I got my girlfriend. You know, that stuff has to clear their mind once they get to that hotel with their teammates. Now, for us as fans, Man, we get to, you know, keep enjoying that. You know, some of us will go out and have a couple pops tonight and and you know, some might wake up, you know, with a bloody Mary and go right back at it again. And you know, eleven AM is five o'clock somewhere, you know. So people, you know, do different things. You know, for me myself, I'm gonna be, you know, sitting in my in my my theater room watching watching the game at home on my couch. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I can watch it again and again and then then go on and watch some other games as well. So we're all fans at this point. That's the life. That is the life. And I think Coach Sarkeesian, he's in his second year. Um, you know, he's been preparing for this game for three months, and he has something that most coaches don't, being having been the OC at Alabama. This is what he said about what the message was to the players regarding Alabama. I think one thing we know, you know, unless CDC does something crazy, we're going to have 101,000 people in the stadium. That's all they, we can fit, you know. There's not going to be 300,000 people in there or something crazy. Um, they're going to play with 11. We're going to play with 11. Um, last time I checked, the field's not going to change. And so how do we want to play in the environment that, that we're comfortable being in? Um, we don't have to make this more than it needs to be. We, we need to focus on the task at hand and, and our preparation and recognize we're playing a good opponent who's really well coached, who's a disciplined football team. So you can say coach speak or he's not wrong. Both. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, you know, he's not wrong in the sense that they're going to have to do what they always have to do. You're going to have to block and tackle. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to make plays in critical situations, you know, and the team that makes the most of those plays is the team that's going to win. As a matter of fact, there's a study being done that, you know, it's all about the big play now. The teams that make the most big plays are typically the ones that are winning the games. So yeah. everybody's looking for big plays. Everybody's trying to hit it big to say, you know what I'm saying? So that's what it's all about every single week. It doesn't change for them. You know, it doesn't matter who's coming in that stadium. There, it, it could be whoever. And they still have to go out and do the same things. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about don't make this game bigger than it is. Yeah. Because, you know, when you start hearing all the hype and college game day and all these fans are coming in town and everybody's been waiting for, you know, is Texas back? And I mean, all, all this stuff that doesn't matter. The only things that the only thing that matters is when that ball kicks off. You're trying to whoop that guy across from you every time you take a play and try to win every single one of those plays. And you're not going to win every play, mm. but you are fighting to win every single one of those plays. And that's what he's talking about. So if you had to pick one area or maybe just maybe you may have some other some notes that are taken, but a lot of people, I'd say 99 percent of people across the country or maybe 95. Let's give Texas some credit. I, I really don't know. But I'd say 95% of people are saying Alabama's leaving Austin with the win. 
Another good portion to say they're going to cover the spread, which is at 20 points right now. Uh, is What is UT's advantage versus Bama in this game that they can exploit Bama, or is there one? Well, you know, I, I say this, you know, literally all the time before I play any opponent. You can win any game on any day. How you construct victory to get out of that stadium with a W is going to be different. You know, it's going to look a lot of different ways. You know, case in point, we played Alabama in 2009, the same year that they played Texas, right, and won the national championship. We were the last team to play them before they played Texas. I was at Auburn. We were an eight-win football team. That's including the bowl game. And we went down and scored on the first possession. Our head coach prior to that possession or prior to that us taking the ball, he said, hey, we're going to take the ball, and if they don't, if they don't, you know, give it to us, or excuse me, if we don't win the toss, then they're probably going to give it to us anyway. So we're going to take the ball down and score, and then we're going to kick an onside kick and get it. We did that. Wow. We were constructing victory during the week on – Hey, this is how we're going to go about getting this W. And it took Alabama until the last seconds of the game on the very last play of the game before they overcame that deficit. We didn't win it, but we fought our tails off. And the next year, that team that fought their tails off against Alabama, who won the national champion, we went to Alabama the next year and went down on them, just like we, they went down on us, and we came back and kicked their butts, for, and we won the national championship that year. So it was kind of a, you know, returning the favor type of thing. So how they construct victory, they're, they're doing that. You know, I can't tell you all the different things that they're going to see or not see. And, you know, a guy takes a step, a lazy step this way or doesn't, you know, they're seeing those things. How they construct victory is going to be, you know, what they're talking about all this week. What we as fans and even as coaches want to see more than anything else is, hey, fight your tail off. Because you have no chance if you don't do that. Yeah, that's a fighting chance. One percent is a chance because uh, I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not saying there's an X amount of time and preparation that uh, is required. But there's also turning moments in programs. And that Auburn that at Auburn, that moment was for that program for you. I mean, yes. and even for Alabama as well. Yes. It, it's amazing the direction. That uh, right. one game, one game plan can take. When you look at the quarterback, uh, Quinn Ewers, I felt like they were very vanilla last week for a reason, a purpose. So as a as a coach, what would be the game plan for him? As would it be more complimentary for people around him, or just go with uh, taking shots? I, I really don't know. Well, you, you know, again, I you know. I don't know Quinn's capabilities or, you know, how he processes the game at this moment. So I really can't speak to, nor can anyone else outside of that room um, or that coaching staff speak to what he can and cannot do or what he needs to do in this game. I'll tell you what, the only thing I can say going into this game, which is going to look at it differently probably than most fans, is whatever the game plan is, whether he's going over the top or throwing it intermediate, he's going to have to hit his top of his drop and get rid of that ball because those defensive ends and their nickel package are coming and they're coming right now. You're not going to have a lot of time. And if he's not hitting the back, his back foot and releasing that ball, uh, he's going to be, he's going to, he's going to get sacked, you know, and it's just that simple. Those, they have the best player in college football on the defensive side of the ball as a defensive end. And he is that dude. It's just that simple. And that's funny. Strangely enough, you you brought him up. And he was asked, and, and Will Anderson is the guy you're talking about. I love I just the first week that I've heard him that I've actually taken the time to listen to his interview. This guy is brilliant. I mean, <laughs> but he knows what not to say. This is when they asked about going against Quinn Ewers. Here, you be the judge of this. this he's well coached in many ways. Let's say that. That's right. I mean, you know, I try to approach every quarterback the same, you know, but for a young quarterback like that, it's, 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 it's going to be fun. You know, this is the first game, you know, um, going against a defense like this. So, you know, we're just going to go out there and do our thing, and we're not going to try to do nothing more, just go out there and get, play the game plan that our coach give us. Well done. Well done, Will Anderson. 
<laughs> hey, hey, you you have to look at his face when he's saying those things, and you can tell, boy. You know what I mean? I remember right before we played played Alabama, they had a, a Quinnen is his name, the the big defensive tackle, uh, big dude in, inside. He was talking about tackling, you know, getting after Kyler right. Murray, and he kind of laughed about it. You probably remember that he kind of oh, Menahue, really. Charles, yeah, Menahue, yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't Charles. No. I'm talking when we before I was at I was at the other school. And oh. before we played, <laughs> before we played Alabama in in a game with 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 Kyler Murray, um, he was kind of, you know, he kind of said something. He said the right things, but he kind of laughed when he said it. You know, you can just kind of tell and everybody was talking about it. So those guys are coached up to say the right things. Right. But at the end of the day, they're going to think what they want to think. And and they're looking forward to a a freshman QB or a rookie QB, whatever you want right. to call it. They're looking forward to getting after him. They didn't get any sacks last week. Zero. Goose egg. And you're talking about a team that led the country in sacks last week, last year. Yeah. You know, they had, what, 50-something sacks last year? So they had zero to start start out. Texas had three. So they're going to come here with their ends, ears pin, pinned back, and they're going to be looking to, to get after somebody because they want to get their sack numbers up. You know, I'm not going to ask for a prediction. Uh, but how do you compensate for this massive pass rush that that Quinn will fill? I mean, I know you have two freshman offensive linemen starting. Um, will you? I, I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to go ahead and say this: extra tight end and Roshan Johnson, who is a beast of a running back to Bijan. Both of them are going to have to chip somebody. I would imagine. <laughs> Hey, there's multiple ways to try to control a great pass rusher. The problem is Alabama has another one on the other side in, in 15. And so if you're going to try to set your protection one way, then that's going to give you problems the other way, you know, because they run games opposite of Will sometimes because they give him what I call, a, you know, a two-way go on his rush. You know, he can come inside or he can come outside, and they're they're ready to protect him, you know, in terms of containment. Right. with whatever whether it's an outside linebacker or safety or whatever so they're protecting him to give him that freedom to do him um but in the other side like i said they have another another defensive end so you know you're gonna have to protect both edges and if you're doing that now you're talking about you're talking about less guys getting out you know what i mean yes and and that becomes a problem so you can't do that every single time the most effective way to you know, like Utah State did last week. You know, the most effective way is to hit that back foot and throw. Now they only threw for fifty-seven yards, yeah. but <laughs> but you know we're not Utah State, so we got different athletes on the edges, and so you know what's going to happen with us is different than what they experienced. But that quarterback did get rid of the ball, and that's why they didn't give up a sack. And that's what we're going to have to do. This is that's great analysis. Finally, um, so I do a top ten. And then four on the outside looking in, and it, it's just just my observation analysis, if you will. I want to pull that up, and I, I want to see. Just would love to hear your opinion from a coach uh, who has seen a lot of programs, a lot of programs, and maybe you'll see why I picked X, Y, and Z or whomever. Um, here we go. So th this is what it looks like for me if. I really think K State is a what like what everyone likes to call a dark horse. Mm. Um, I, I think honestly, until some until Ohio State proves me wrong, I I, I do think Georgia is going to be in there at some point. Who do they play Alabama again? But when you look at who is playing, it's too early to really judge a football team unless they've lost already. <clears throat> Is is anyone any team that I'm not including from you from your vantage point? Is this accurate in your eyes, or do you see it much differently? I I see it as from a coach's perspe perspective. I see it much different differently. Yeah. I don't I don't look at you know what teams are ranked or where they're ranked right now. Like I have no idea who's the best team in the country right yeah. now. Yeah. Nobody does. Right yeah. now, you can look at a team and say, man, that team is really good, which that, that's what I thought when I looked at Alabama. Um, I thought the same thing when I looked at Georgia, you know, in, in just multiple areas and partly because of the trigger man. 
we all know that great quarterbacks wins games. Right. That's what's going to win games. And both Alabama and Georgia, with their quarterbacks returning, you know, playing in the national championship, that's the first thing I, I sit back and say, okay, those two teams are good yeah. for sure. And their, their their defense is really, really good. Now, you know, when you look at all the rest of the teams, and I'm not saying that those teams are the best too, I mean, you really have to play this thing out. Like, we don't really know how good Florida is yet. We don't really know that. You know, just because they beat up Utah, that doesn't mean anything. We don't really know how good Georgia really is yet because how good is Oregon? You know what I mean? You know, uh, shoot, Utah beat the, you know, now they had some more kids, but Utah beat them to beat the dog out of them twice. Yeah. You know, last year. And so, you know, to sit there and say, well, because this team beat this team, well, we, we won't know who the best teams are because some teams great, you know, gain momentum toward the end of the year and they get better. Mm-hmm. They may suffer a loss early. And then by the end of the year, they're playing the best ball. Case in point, the 2016 Oklahoma Sooners, we lost to University of Houston. But we were still Big 12 champs. That's that year. right. Tom Herman. And, t- Tom Herman in the University of Houston, you know. And we also lost a week or two later, two weeks later, to Ohio State in our own stadium, who was a very good football team. So here we are sitting here at one and two. You know, everybody's writing that team off. And that team ran off, didn't didn't lose again. You, you know what I mean? So including the bowl game, you know, where we end up beating Auburn in the bowl game, in the Sugar Bowl. So, you know, to sit here and say, you know, you know who the best teams are in week one and two, you know, you really don't. You know, you're going to figure it out as you continue to go. You can look at it and say, man, that team is really good. But to sit there and place a number on them, for me as a coach, that's hard right now, you know, because there's all kind of things that are going to go through the course of the year, and you're going to find out about teams. You're going to think somebody's good at the beginning of the year that's not very good, and you know, and vice versa. So, and that's why the college football playoff poll is doesn't exist until after midseason. That's exactly right. That's a good reason. <laughs> that's a great reason. <laughs> Man, this is this is this is the this is why I, I there should be a paid premium cost for Jay Bullwear's content. <laughs> you know, anyway, that's good stuff. I appreciate that. that. Good stuff. Man. Definitely check me out. Check me out on a little little juice. Yes. Um, uh, I have a podcast up talking about Texas and Alabama. Uh, the, the previews from a coach's perspective, as well as a recap from last week. And, um, you know, just give me a follow. This is what it looks like if you're searching for what the graphic, what you're looking like uh, on Buzzsprout. And it goes to all of all of the podcast listening platforms as well. When you go through Buzzsprout, it's a great platform. Uh, a little juice with Coach Jay Bullware. Good friend, great coach, and uh, man, a good family guy. And he has a lot, a lot of great things to say. And man, he's he's fun to talk to. If you ever get him, know him on a personal level, <laughs> hey, be prepared because if you're if you're like me, we we could easily do a two hour conversation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was three hours, by the way. <laughs> what, was it three hours? It was three hours. <laughs> oh my god. It's like, uh, hey, what's wrong with teenage girl? That's what we were doing. That's know? what we were doing. Yeah, Gen Zers yeah. over here. Well, they don't talk <laughs> on the phone much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't. You're right. They don't. Jay, I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked about this podcast launch for you, and and visit it. A little juice with Coach Jay Bull, where, like he said, uh, has a little something on uh, for Texas and Alabama, and his knowledge. And how he communicates that is well worth it, man. And I appreciate you taking time, man. We are, it's, hey, stories inside the man cave and you and your podcast, definitely the perfect alignment. I appreciate you, man, my brother. So for the VIP alumni, two times now, and will probably be another. That's right. Jay Bullware for That's Coach right. Mo, the OG Man Cave Boys, Coach Mo, Big Mike, and Hardball Hearts. We are out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. I'm in my car in the giddy up. My guy.